Okay. All right, well, buenas tardes, uh, everybody, and welcome to the Spanish and the Global Studies Speaker Series, our spring edition. Um, I'm Novia Pagón, um, Assistant Professor of Spanish and Global Studies. Um, and I'm thrilled that you could join us this evening uh, for what promises to be a thought-provoking uh, presentation and discussion. We're excited to welcome Dr. Matthew Petway to our virtual Governor's State Campus here. Um, this event is part of the Making Spanish and Global Studies Accessible to All project, which um, I co-direct with Dr. Yelena radovich Fanta, who's an assistant professor in the Anthropology and Sociology program, also here with us tonight. Um, the aim of the project is to create opportunities for students from across our campus uh, community to access events, resources, courses, um, study abroad, all related to Spanish and global studies. Um, so this project is made possible by the Department of Education's Undergraduate International Studies and Foreign Language Grant. Um, I'd also like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences, especially uh, Rhonda Jackson and Dean Andre Merrick, and the Center for Student Engagement and Intercultural Programs at GSU um, for their support of today's event. So before I introduce Dr. Petway, I just wanna to get to a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as I said earlier, this event is being recorded and streamed live on Facebook. Um, after Dr. Petway's pre presentation, which should be about 35 minutes, um, we'll have time for questions and discussion and we encourage that. Um, for now, um, if you could please be sure if you aren't already, if you could mute your microphones so we can have the best sound possible. Uh, we really appreciate it. Okay, so it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Matthew Petway to Governor's State. Um, he's an assistant professor of Spanish at the University of South Alabama, uh, where he is associated with the Africana Studies program. He teaches Afro-Latin American, Caribbean, and Spanish literatures. Um, Dr. Petway's research explores how Afro-Latin Afro Americans who endured extreme trauma in the colonial era took hold of the aesthetic and spiritual tools available to conceive of poetics of emancipation. His work has been published in the publication of the Afro-Latin American Research Association, Zora Neale Hurston Forum, American Studies Journal, and Del Caribe. He also contributed the inaugural essay to the volume Black Writing, Culture, and the State in Latin America. He was a visiting scholar in the Lilas Benson Latin American Studies Collections at the University of Texas at Austin in 2014. And in 2013, he was the University of Can the University of Kansas named him the Langston Hughes Visiting Professor. His first book, Cuban Literature in the Age of Black Insurrection, Manzano, Placido, and Afro-Latino Religion, was released in 2020 and is part of the Caribbean Studies series of the University Press of Mississippi. Welcome, Dr. Petway. We're glad to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Pagoni, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, I want to thank Governor State University, uh, Dean Andre Marek. Uh, I want to uh, thank Professor Novia Pagon and Yelena Radovich Fanta. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Me dijo que sí. So I think we're, we're going to be fine. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew Petway, and I'm Assistant Professor of Spanish at the University of South Alabama here in Mobile which is my father's hometown. And it is an honor to speak with you tonight about my book, Cuban Literature in the Age of Black Insurrection, Manzano, Placido, and Afro-Latina Religion. This is the second time I've had an opportunity this month, uh, Black History Month, to speak uh, about my book. And the third time I've been able to give a talk during Black History Month about my book. Uh, so it's unfortunate that we can't be together in person. Uh, but, uh, but I'm very excited for the opportunity and look forward to your questions. So I'm going to share my screen with you uh, because I have a, uh, a, uh, a presentation. Let me take a moment here to come to the current slide. My presentation tonight uh, is going to focus on one of the two authors uh, whose names you see mentioned in the subtitle. You see Manzano. Uh, Juan Francisco Manzano was his full name, and he is somewhat akin to Frederick Douglass, very well known in United States circles, particularly in African American scholarly circles, a tradition that is sacred to me as a, an African American scholar. Uh, but Manzano actually published his slave narrative prior to Frederick Douglass. Douglass published his first of three narratives in 1845, and Manzano published his narrative in 1840 in London, an English translation, though the Spanish uh, would not, the Spanish version would not become available uh, until the, fully available until the 20th century. Placido, or Gabriel de la Concepción Valdez, 
is the other author um, that uh, my book explores. And Palacio is something like Martin Delaney. Interestingly enough, because he was born free like Martin Delaney in the United States, Martin Delaney was so fascinated with Palacio that he actually featured Palacio in his novel, Blakes and the Huts of America. So if you're doing comparative literature, you've already got a, a new topic in case you didn't know about uh, the connection between these authors. The title of my talk tonight is Manzano at the Crossroads, African-Inspired Spirituality and Black Liberation. Manzano en la Crucijada. Let me take a moment here. So I'm going to go right into uh, my remarks tonight and introduce you uh, to the argument of the book. I'm going to give you the argument of the book, and then I'm going to focus on one or two, one of the two authors, and that'll be Juan Francisco Manzano. So my book's argument is the following. My central claim is that Juan Francisco Manzano and his contemporary Gabriel de la Concepcion Valdez, also known as Placido, portrayed African-inspired spirituality beneath the surface of Hispano-Catholic aesthetics, which in effect transformed early Cuban literature into an instrument of Black liberation. I argue that Manzano and Placido seized upon images of the Virgin Mary and Catholic saints and resignified neoclassical and romantic tropes to conceal the African-inspired ritual subtext they had relied upon to procure myriad modalities of freedom, many forms of freedom. Although much of their writing touched upon uncontroversial motifs, their politically motivated portrayal of religion often subverted the Catholic traditions they claimed to represent. And that's very important to me because today I'm talking about the subversion of Catholic traditions, particularly the Catholic tradition of reverence to the saints, reverence to the saints, to those entities uh, that were once human that are canonized and then become uh, conduits between the material and spiritual world, become conduits between uh, ca the Catholic practitioner and, and God, uh, because they can uh, essentially function as conduits. Let me take a moment here to introduce Juan Francisco Manzano. Uh, Juan Francisco Manzano is a a born, a believed to be, have been born in 1797 and have lived until 1853. Uh, Manzano was born in Havana, Cuba, to Maria de Pilar and Toribe de Castro. Now, Maria de Pilar and Toribe de Castro were essentially enslaved uh, household servants. Uh, and so they were situated in a position where they were close to the enslavers themselves. Um, who was essentially uh, uh, the Martianess. The Martianess and her daughter were the most significant of these enslavers in Manzano's slave narrative, published in 1845 years before Frederick Douglass. Manzano's mother charged him to take care of his siblings after her husband, his father, Toribio, passed away. His father was, uh, was a musician, um, a harpist. So it seems that the artistic thing uh, really ran in the family. Juan Francisco Manzano escaped the Matanza sugar labor camp uh, where he was enslaved circa 1817. So that date of his escape is approximate date. It's a date that we have in part because of Cuban scholars like Roberto Friol. So I want to acknowledge that. In Havana, Manzano taught himself to read and write, and he availed himself of elite literary networks to publish his first collection of poetry in 1821 and the second collection in 1830. So Manzano is believed to have been the first Cuban, either black or white, to publish a collection of poetry. So he stands out already even before we get to uh, the publication of his slave narrative in English in 1840 in London, which is used essentially as a form of propaganda to uh, end the slave trade to Cuba. Uh, so how does Manzano negotiate that? Well, how does, he, how does he become free? He doesn't become free when he escapes in 1817, but he does save himself from the physical abuse at the hands of uh, essentially a mistress that was interested in preventing him from becoming free and interested in preventing him from uh, essentially attaining um, uh, or becoming a, a, an intellectual. I like to call this the quid pro quo. So we're probably familiar with that term considering uh, uh, recent events. The quid pro quo, Monsanto's slave narrative was his price for freedom. He's approached essentially by leading uh, white Cuban intellectual at the time, Domingo del Monte, uh, 
uh, who says, if you provide your slave narrative, we will uh, purchase your freedom, which is essentially uh, precisely what uh, they do, um, precisely what they do for Manzano. So Manzano wrote his autobiography in exchange for his freedom in 1836, and his autobiography was published in London in 1840. In 1835, Manzano began to negotiate his brother's emancipation from slavery, and uh, Manzano published a poem called A Dream for My Second Brother in 1838, and he later died in 1853. The only date I left out here uh, that I want to mention very quickly is that Manzano makes Placido's acquaintance in 1839, circa 1839. And he makes Placido's acquaintance. The two develop essentially a friendship. Uh, they, they collaborate aesthetically and they collaborate politically. The precise nature of their political and literary collaboration is not entirely known, but I do explore it in chapter um, uh, six of the book. Uh, the collaboration gets to the point where um, they're both accused of being members of a movement to annihilate the white population. The movement, in, in fact, was a movement against slavery and a movement to establish republics of blacks and mulattoes on the island. Uh, but that we're going to come back to that briefly when we talk about Manzano uh, in this particular presentation, because I want to discuss that moment in 1817 primarily in this talk as a moment where Juan Francisco Manzano found himself at the crossroads. He was between freedom and slavery, uh, between literacy and between essentially a stunted intellectual development, an arrested development, we might say, thinking about the African-American musical group from the 90s. Here, here are the key concepts from my talk tonight. First, Black liberation versus the redemption of the Catholic God. Secondly, transculturated colonial literature. Now, transculturated colonial literature depends upon um, an, a concept that uh, Cuban scholar Fernando Ortiz developed in 1940. And I'm using that concept to develop my own idea, my own theoretical idea about the fact that some literature produced in 19th century Cuba demonstrates uh, evidence of the processes of transculturation, the changes that took place in Cuba based upon African, European, and indigenous interactions over the centuries. Changes that became permanent parts of Cuban culture, irreversible, essentially. And finally, el espíritu de la encrucijada, the spirit of the crossroads, known in Haiti as Legba, um, and known in um, Nigeria as a shu, and known in Cuba as a legua, or legua a chu. Okay? So we'll be talking about this from the a Yoruba-inspired standpoint, the spirit of the crossroads, and the way in which this spirit of the crossroads is transculturated is with a, a Catholic saint, with a Catholic saint. I want to talk briefly about Black liberation versus the redemption of the Catholic God. This is an image that, that I find uh, particularly striking because um, it demonstrates uh, a European Catholic priest with a crucifix in his hand, speaking to someone, presumably uh, African, that he is about to convert. And if we look at the image and we take, uh, we look to the, what is my left, uh, the left of my screen, you'll see what appears to be a man with a turban. So you have the impression that these men are African men. This man may, to the left may be Muslim, are African men, and they're being baptized for the first time. So the Catholic Church did have what I call a slave catechism. And I write about this in the book in some detail, particularly in reference to Manzano, because he is like the Cuban Frederick Douglass, or Frederick Douglass might be considered an African-American Manzano. Um, because the slave catechism called for redemption from sin. One of the things the Catholic Church needed to do in order to be effective politically was to dissuade Africans of some of their original conceptions of the spirit world, to convince Africans of the concept of sin uh, whereas Africans would have thought about transgressions being something against the family, against community, and against ancestors, the Catholic priesthood wanted to convince Africans essentially that when they sinned, when they tra their transgressions were, were against God, and that as a result, they had a responsibility to be redeemed from that sin. And this way, it, the Catholic Church could then convince Africans that they were essentially in the same or similar place as their masters. So if the masters did something wrong, well, 
At the end of the day, we are all sinners. At the end of the day, we are all sinners. The church as a whole did not condemn racial slavery. That's very important. As a whole, did not condemn racial slavery. So Manzano found himself either in a position where he would embrace this concept of redemption, where the soul could be free, but the body would remain in chain, or where he could procure the power necessary to liberate himself, known in Cuban Spanish as Ache, coming once again from the Yoruba, coming once again from the Yoruba. Here's an image uh, on the left of a Catholic saint holding the Christ child, that's San Antonio or St. Anthony. Um, and I want to introduce this concept of transculturation. What do I mean by transculturation? How, do, how are cultural meanings formed, forged in a colonial environment? Once again, I wanna give credit to Cuban scholar known in Cuba as Don Fernando Ortiz. Well, Fernando Ortiz conceived transculturation in Contra Punteo Cubano de Tabaco y Azúcar in 1940 to problematize Herskovitz's notion of acculturation. He divined transculturation he defined transculturation as a process whereby Europeans, indigenous persons, and Africans created a third cultural space through their sustained reciprocal yet unequal interactions in colonial Cuba. So for Ortiz, Cuban culture was a result of geographic and cultural uprooting, dislocations, and forced adjustments to new landscapes. So in this instance, I'm talking about the influence of people who today would be called Nigerians, Africans of various ethnicities that spoke the Yoruba language, Yoruba being uh, a lingua franca and part of West Africa, particularly in today what is called Nigeria, but not exclusively in Nigeria. So what happens when those Africans find themselves in a new landscape? Uh, there is the forfeiture of some cultural elements uh, and the imposition of a dominant culture. But through processes of resistance and negotiation, Africans are able essentially to create new cultural meanings. Today, I'll be discussing the ways in which this Catholic saint holding the Christ child, right, is ultimately transculturated with a legua or the spirit of the crossroads. So some things to take into consideration here is uh, that this Catholic saint, Saint Anthony, holding the Christ child, is uh, transculturated with the legua in part because of the association with childhood. You have the Christ childhood, legua is sometimes thought of as a child or being childlike because he's considered mischievous. Uh, Saint Anthony of Padua uh, was a, uh, a missionary and he traveled for his mission, his missionary work. Well, a legua uh, facilitates movements on the crossroads. He opens the crossroads, so it's essentially allowing people when the road bifurcates to travel in one direction versus the other. But there's several differences, of course. One of the most significant being that San Antonio is considered pure, beneficent, holy, and saintly. Whereas El Legua is an ambivalent figure. He is not evil, but he is ambivalent and he is given to anger. So he must be appeased. Let's talk a bit about transculturated uh, colonial literature. Transculturated colonial literature, as I'm theorizing in Cuban literature in the age of black insurrection, is written in the idioms of Spanish culture. So you'll have symbols such as St. Anthony or San Antonio, which is mentioned in my book that Manzano mentions in his slave narrative, we'll talk about in a minute. But the meaning of those uh, idioms or those symbols uh, are either subverted or somehow uh, transformed. These transculturated colonial texts are situated on the periphery, but they're palatable to a metropolitan audience. And so I'm thinking about Mary Louise Pratt's theory of autoethnography uh, from her, her book, uh, came out in the 1990s, uh, Imperial Eyes, uh, where she talks about autoethnography. She talks about autoethnography in reference to the Inca, Guamán Poma de Ayala, in particular, and the ways in which he situates um, the Inca within uh, a Catholic universal tradition. Uh, but I'm interested a bit more in the ways in which African knowledge systems operate within texts that have a Spanish Catholic facade, where, the, where Spanish Catholicism functions in the text, at least, as uh, 
as a form of camouflage. So these are texts that are suffused with African-inspired spiritual knowledge. I'm going to be arguing that Manzano engages the saints in a way that's inconsistent with the hagiography uh, with St. Anthony, uh, but consistent with the Yoruba spirits, the Yoruba spirits that negotiate between heaven and earth, uh, between the spiritual and material worlds. Those Yoruba spirits are known as Orishas. Uh, in effect, transculturated colonial literature subverts the inherent meanings of Catholic symbolism and European literary tropes. And here again, we have St. Anthony and Elegua. St. Anthony and Elegua. Let me talk briefly about the Orishas before we actually get to Manzano's text. I'd like to make sure that we have some proper introduction uh, so that the literary re reading itself makes sense. Uh, I want to rely on another Cuban scholar, Natal Natalia Bolivar, uh, who explains that the Orishas do not embody the absolute concepts of good and evil. Rather, the Orishas embody the relationship between positive energies and destructive powers, since there cannot be peace without discord and there is no safety without danger. So I want to take a moment to speak about this. The term Orisha uh, does not technically mean God. We're talking about a pantheon using that word of Greek etymology, right? Which makes us think about the Greek gods, uh, but not technically gods. The belief in Yoruba, uh, Yoruba cosmology or Yoruba spirituality is that there is one God with a number of different names, Olodumare, Olorun, Olofi. Uh, the Orishas then are those sovereigns that command the natural phenomena. Uh, so one spirit would be have command over the ocean. If you're a fan of contemporary African-American performer, Beyonce, you'll know that she has been given to represent herself in gold uh, or yellow and uh, in a hyper feminine way in which fertility is celebrated. And she's associating herself with the sweet waters. But what she's doing essentially, though I'm not speaking about this particular entity today, I use it as an example to introduce the Orishas. What she's doing essentially is she is channeling a, uh, Ochun or Oshun, the spirit or the sovereign of the sweet waters uh, in her, um, one of her older videos, Hold Up, which I used in, uh, in my class the other day. And uh, even in Black is King as well, uh, in one of her live performances as well. Uh, to the consternation of some people, but very interesting to others. So essentially the Orishas are neither good nor evil. Uh, they don't embody those absolute concepts. Um, what you find instead is that there is a search for moderation and equilibrium. There's a search for equilibrium and moderation. So a problem exists when you have too much of something, when you have excess. Excess is in and of itself considered the problem or when the values of the community, the African community have been uh, disregarded by someone who is selfish is thinking about themselves, or perhaps when someone decides to use ritual powers to harm someone in the community. That is what the Catholics would have called witchcraft, uh, though I don't typically use that word, but that would have been an abusive use of ritual powers. So in order to understand the way in which Monsanto is engaging the saints, we need to understand that he's not operating with the absolute concepts of good and evil. Now, it doesn't mean that Juan Francisco Manzano did not consider himself a Catholic. He did consider himself a Catholic. He called himself a Catholic, uh, for example, uh, we can talk about this a bit later, but when he found himself embroiled in the 1844 anti-slavery movement with Placido, uh, he definitely referred to himself as a Catholic uh, under questioning, uh, I think in part for rhetorical reasons, but he was baptized in the church, he married in the church, and when he died, he received the last rites, just as Placido. And so there's an understanding about the spirit world that's really not black and white. Uh, I wanna share with you this particular, uh, uh, I find this funny, <laughs> but this particular uh, set of signs in English, one saying, do not enter, and the other saying, enter only. I'm sharing this with you in order to introduce the principle of non-contradiction in African cosmologies. 
uh, and African spiritual philosophies, such as the Yoruba cosmology that we're discussing today. And the principle of non-contradiction means essentially that in order to, uh, that, that different from Western philosophy, what we have essentially is a situation in which uh, two things can exist that are apparently uh, opposite can exist within the same space. Two things that are apparently opposite can exist within the same space. If we think about Western philosophy, what is the first thing that you say to someone if you want to discredit their argument, you tell them that they're contradicting themselves. You tell them that they're contradicting themselves, la contradiction, right? To counter say, to unsay. But within uh, uh, African spiritual systems, uh, these apparent contradictions are possible because they're systems that harmonize differences instead of placing them in direct antithetical relationship with one another. This is what Monsanto does with the saints. Let's talk about the spirit of the crossroads. We gather here tonight to talk about this particular spirit, Elegua. Uh, I'd like to share with you, uh, in effect, uh, this image. This is uh, not from Cuba. Uh, as far as I know, this is from the US South. This image is used um, in uh, blogs online in reference to the blues and in reference to Robert Johnson, who is said, who became overnight, an overnight blues sensation playing his guitar. Uh, he's said to have gone to the crossroads, have done some sort of ritual in order to be able to uh, become an extraordinary blues man. And uh, as such, uh, folk down here where I live say, well, he sold his soul to the devil. Uh, but those of us who know a bit more about the crossroads understand that uh, the devil doesn't exist in traditional African thought. So who is or what is the spirit of the crossroads? The spirit of the crossroads is an otherworldly entity that governs the meeting of the spiritual and material worlds. Okay, it provide communication between God and humankind, or the Creator, Olodumare, Oloruno Lofi, the names of Creator in Yoruba, and humankind. Elegua, which is the name it used in Spanish to refer to the spirit of the crossroads, is ambivalent but not evil ambivalent but not evil. Uh, one of the ways in which we get this notion that Elegua or Shu in Yoruba is evil, evil, excuse me, is through the work of uh, missionaries who translated Yoruba into uh, English in order to, to do missionary work. So you have to wrap our heads around it. Uh, it's, very, it's very different than what is typically represented uh, about African inspired spirituality in, uh, in the US media. So Legua must be appeased, uh, lest chaos ensue. So in many rituals, Legua uh, is the first. In fact, to my knowledge, in Cuba, typically Legua, the first uh, act of reverence is performed in reference to Legua because Legua opens and closes the crossroads and must be appeased, lest chaos ensue. That's very important. Ambivalence versus evil ambivalence versus evil. Let's see if we can wrap our heads around that to understand what Juan Francisco Manzano might have been doing in 1817 when he finds himself uh, needing to save his own life so that he can fulfill his mother's trust and become a father to his, uh, his siblings. So the spirit of the crossroads is God's messenger. This is the way that Nigerian scholar Toyin Falola puts it, who is himself a Yoruba speaking uh, West African. Uh, in order to emphasize uh, the points that I'm making regarding ambivalence, I'm going to cite directly from Toyin Falola. Quote, a shoe does not seek to destroy the bad and malevolent so that only the good and benevolent remain. Rather, a shoe sees the positive in both forces. A shoe, unlike the biblical Satan, does not work in opposition to God's plan for humankind. Neither does a shoe have the mission to completely destroy us. Seeking his equivalence in Christianity, as many have done when they compare a shoe with the New Testament Satan, is very much misguided. So I'm citing from uh, a book that he edited, a series of essays called A Shoe, Yoruba, Yoruba God, 
power, and imaginative frontiers. He's using the word God, I would say, heuristically, because technically he would be considered uh, an Orisha. But what's significant here is that uh, this spirit of the crossroad does not seek to eliminate uh, that which is deemed evil by human beings. Uh, there is no good without bad in this particular spiritual philosophy. Uh, both have their uses, both have a certain utility. Uh, so he's not like the biblical Satan, he's not working in opposition to mankind, uh, uh, but he is capable of provoking chaos. So he has to be appeased. Let's go a bit further here and then we'll get into the text. Manzano at the crossroads. So when did Juan Francisco Manzano find himself as did Robert Johnson, uh, I will call him the king of the blues, but there's so many of them, uh, but this blues great, like uh, Robert Johnson, when did he find himself at the crossroads? In 1817, circa 1817, once again, this is the approximate date that we have for Monsanto's escape uh, from the slave labor camp. And I use that term on purpose because here in the South, typically the word plantation is used in plantation though it's an accurate term, at the same time, lends a, a sense of a luxury to the space, and kind of the, the, the delights of a, of a long gone aristocracy. And I wanted to throw that aside. It was a slave labor camp uh, where children were bought and sold. And Monsanto was one of those children. Uh, he arrived in Havana circa 1817 when he escaped on horseback. So he's at the crossroads at that point. On one side, uh, Monsanto might have lost his life because his mother had just passed. First, his father dies, then his mother dies, Maria de Pilar. Um, and they were beating him half silly. Uh, there was a struggle over the inheritance that his mother had left him. So enslaved people were technically by law able to inherit property uh, in Spanish America. That's uh, an important thing to take note. And they were also able to marry. That's also important. It was considered a sacrament in the Catholic church. In 1838, Monsanto published a poem in an effort to save his brother from slavery. This is many years after escaping to Havana where he learned how to read and write, but he taught himself to read and write much like Frederick Douglass. In 1838, then he publishes a poem in an effort to save his brother. We're not sure what happens with regard to that. And I discussed that in other talks uh, that I've given. In 1839, Monsanto and Plasso became acquainted and they collaborate aesthetically and politically. They become, they become acquainted, excuse me, and they collaborate aesthetically and politically. The nature of that collaboration is not entirely clear, but they argue about a poem that supposedly uh, one or the other wrote in praise of British abolitionism. They were uh, both part of a movement called the 1844 Anti-Slavery Movement, better known as the latter conspiracy or La Escalera. Uh, scholars such as Robert Perquet and Aisha Finch have written extensively about it, and I deal with this movement uh, in chapter one, chapters one and six of the book. Masano found himself once again at the crossroads uh, when he withdrew his allegiance from the 1844 anti-slavery movement. The details of that, quite frankly, uh, really constitute an entirely different lecture. And I have yet to really give a lecture about that moment, um, but his support for the movement did wane as did the support of others. And once again, when he was under question, he said, hey, um, I am a Roman Catholic. And he said, Roman, I think he said, Catholico Romano Apostolico, algo así. But he was very specific, right, to reassert that normative uh, part of his identity, that, that uh, uh, multifaceted identity that Monsano had. Let's take a look at Monsano's relationship to the saints. I'm going to read here from his slave narrative, from the original manuscript. And you'll see here uh, on what is the left side of my screen uh, what appears to be scribbling. This is actually the first page of the original manuscript, which I was able to consult in Havana many years ago, which a brilliant uh, Brazilian scholar has made available to all of us. The Cubans would not give me a copy of this, but you know, hey, I respect them. You know, it, it was their patrimony, but somehow he got this and uh, he has this online now. Manzano said, quote, my confidence reached such a point that beseeching the heavens to lighten my load, 
I spent nearly the entire early evening praying a certain number of our fathers and Hail Marys to all the saints and the heavenly hosts so that the next day would not be as adverse as the last. If some common and painful pressures befell me, I only attributed them to my lack of devotion or to the anger of some saint whom I have forgotten for the next day, end quote. So I want to point to the fact that Monsai was beseeching the heavens. The term he's using here is very Catholic in nature, beseeching the heavens to lighten his load. He talks about our fathers and Hail Marys, which are part of Catholic liturgy, right? He uses the term saints and the heavenly host. But then he says, he's concerned that the next day wouldn't be as adverse as the last. And he says that when these pressures befell him, he attributed to his lack of devotion or perhaps to the anger of some saint that he had forgotten to properly beseech. We have to focus on the question of the anger here because the Orishas can be angered. The Orishas can be pushed over the edge. The Orishas can withdraw their support if they choose because the benevolent and the maleficent are present at once in the Orishas. So there's a mixture here in the way that he's engaging the saints. Uh, Africans transculturated the saints, the, the Catholic saints with the Orishas uh, in part uh, because like the Catholic saints, the Orishas are conduits between the material and spiritual worlds. And so this provided uh, they provided Africans, particularly in late 18th century Cuba in Cabildos, they provided them with a way to camouflage or to hide the identities of the Orishas. And in the process of doing so, the transculturation ensued. Manzano at the crossroads once again, quoting from the slave narrative, quote, ever since I was a boy, I had the habit of reading everything that was legible in my language. And when I went down the street, I always went around picking up scraps of printed paper. And if it was in verse, I did not pray it until I had learned it by heart. And that way I knew the lives of the most miraculous saints and the prayer verses of the Novena of St. Anthony, those of the Trisagium, at last, all the saints. So here's an end quote. So here's a reference Monsanto makes also in the slave narrative. He talks about his devotion to the saint, the habit of reading everything that he could read. This is a reference to the hagiographies, right? The stories about the saints. Um, then he talks, and we know that in part because he talks about them being on printed paper. Uh, so he would learn it by heart. That speaks to the orality of his tradition. He said he knew all the most miraculous saints by heart and the prayer verses of one particular saint, that Saint Anthony, that Saint Anthony. And Saint Anthony is... Uh, one of the Catholic entities that has been transculturated with the Legua, the Spear of the Crossroads. El Niño Atocha is another. El Niño Atocha is another. So Manzano's uh, devotion to the saints and his emphasis on the most miraculous saints was a problem uh, for the Catholic priesthood because the Catholic priesthood uh, understood the tendency among Cubans to see the saints as being in competition with one another to see the saints as being involved in mystical battles with one another. Uh, didn't have the space in this particular presentation to include that quote, but it is in the book. Uh, if you look at the work of Father Felix Barella, he had a concern that Cubans had become superstitious, as he would call it, uh, because they placed emphasis on the miraculous saints and they believed the saints would do anything they required of them. He was concerned that they would make themselves into oracles and in that way challenge the true authority of the church. Once again, uh, Manzano at the crossroads. In order to understand a bit more about the context in which Manzano is writing, the way in which Roman Catholicism in Cuba and throughout Spanish America was the official religion of these Spanish colonies, Cuba being one of the last uh, colonies in Spanish America to win its freedom. I want to look at the work of a white uh, abolitionist, Francisco Calcaño, uh, and I'm taking this directly from my book. Calcaño portrayed Manzano as a, cito, un ignorante manso, fin de cita, a meek and ignorant person who practiced a form of devotion mixed with fanaticism, quote, end quote, 
Calcaño regarded Marzano as ignorant because of his, uh, as ignorant because of his fanatismo, not his piety. Fanaticism is characterized by excessive enthusiasm and unreasoning zeal. So he's calling Manzano uh, unreasoning in his zeal. He's saying that his enthusiasm is excessive, um, but it's not so much because of his piety, it's the processes by which he's coming up with his liturgical practices. The interesting thing, however, is that Manzano actually was not ignorant because Manzano had been baptized as a Catholic and as someone who was uh, enslaved uh, African descendant in the big house, he had actually learned from heart uh, the sermons of some of the uh, Catholic uh, priests. And uh, he had memorized them by heart. So he was familiar with the doctrines of the church. So what my argument is essentially is that Monsanto draws upon uh, what the church teaches and he adds to it. I'm gonna conclude here with the passage about Monsanto, escape, circa 1817, from the slave labor camp in Matanzas. Manzano described it thus, me puse de rodillas, me encomendé a los santos de mi devoción, me puse el sombrero y moté cuando, cuando iba a andar para retirarme de la casa. I knelt down and I commended myself to the saints of my devotion. I put my hat on and mounted the horse when I was going to get away from the house. This is an image uh, of John Andrew Jackson, uh, an enslaved African-American escaping on horseback. But part of the inheritance that Monsanto had were horses, uh, once again, because the slave people in Latin America and Spanish America could own property. Uh, and Monsanto was trying to settle a debt with his enslaver, uh, the mistress's, the, uh, the marshal's daughter, who became a Martians herself when her mother passed, and, uh, and the Martians was refusing. So Monsanto escapes on horseback, but I want to draw attention to the fact that he's kneeling down, he's committing himself to the saints of his devotion, to those spirits that are intermediaries between the material and spiritual world. What's interesting to note is that Juan Francisco Monsanto, when speaking with uh, Domingo del Monte, who orchestrated his freedom, uh, would give God the credit for freeing him, uh, or give God the credit uh, for miraculous things that took place in his life. But with regard to his slave narrative, he only talks about the saints. In fact, God is not a redemptive figure in Juan Francisco Manzano's slave narrative or his poetry, because Manzano sought not redemption, but to procure the power necessary to liberate himself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for that uh, excellent and fascinating um, presentation. Uh, I'm excited to get into the discussion. Um, so I will uh, open it up. And I see people are, are already uh, posting in the chat here. Um, so if people have questions, you can um, uh, post in the chat if you'd like. Um, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself, if you just raise your hand, just so we have one person at a time um, speaking, that would be uh, great. So questions from the audience. Yes, let me, let me uh, remove the spotlight so I can see everybody here. I can set up here. Fernando, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have a question about, uh, uh, I came a little late and so I was hearing about uh, him when he's talking about Nigeria. And uh, when we talk about in the historical fact of the story, um, I also thought about Senegambia, that now is Senegal and Gambia, that where they came first with the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And I always have the idea that the Afro-Cuban um, tradition or religions come from Senegal. I wasn't sure that it was from Nigeria. And um, my question is, we can find these similarities in Brazil and Argentina and in the form of Palo Mayombe and Ubamba 
Uh, my question is if it has uh, something to do with the doctor's topic or if we taking this topic separately or is uh, a conjunction in the topic between Argentina, Brazil, Senegal, Nigeria, and, and the topic we're talking about. Okay, so Fernando, I wanna make sure that I follow uh, that really I'm grasping your question properly. First, you were asking about whether or not Senegambia or what African scholars tend to call the Western Sudan uh, mm -hmm. uh, is one source of African religious inspiration in Cuba. And then secondly, you're asking about if what Brazil and Argentina have to offer in terms of Afro-Latin American religion, if that's related to what's going on in Cuba? Uh, yeah, in, um, in, uh, there's also another branch of this, it's called Palo Mayombe in, mm -hmm. in Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, in Cuba, they call Palero. Yeah, Palero, right? yeah. In, in Brazil, this is big. And right next in uh, Argentina, not in Buenos Aires, north in uh, the area of Misiones, uh, there is groups of uh, Afro-descendant Argentinians that practice a religion similar to Santeria, but it's called Umbamba. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was, my, my question was, is okay. these well, three religions are related and they split up or there is a point of conjunction? Like Okay, well, I'll, I'll do my best to answer first by saying, first, thanks for, thank you. No, no, no problem. Thank you for the question first. Uh, with regard to Senegambia, yes, there were Africans brought to the Western Hemisphere against their will from Senegambia. Uh, I know that uh, David Wheat at Michigan State University, a historian, has done some work on that, uh, arguing that the Caribbean was not a backwater um, in the early, early centuries of Spanish colonialism. So you may want to look at David Wheat's work uh, on that. His work is outside the scope of what I'm dealing with because I'm dealing with the years between 1797 and 1844 in the book. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, okay. When Manzano was born and when Manzano and Plaza find themselves before the Spanish being interrogated for their involvement in anti-slavery conspiracy. Uh, but yes, Brazil definitely is suffused with African inspired or Afro Latin American religious traditions. I'm less familiar with what Argentina has to offer in terms of that. I know that Uruguay uh, is known for, for some traditions. Brazil, I've been to Brazil. Uh, I was just thinking about it today. It was part of, um, part of a candomblé uh, presentation, uh, not presentation, excuse me, uh, ritual there. Um, now with regard to, but I don't know a lot about the Brazilian religion, I would look at uh, Matori's work, M-A-T-O-R-Y, Matori, Laurent Matori, L-O-R-A-N-D, M-A-T-O-R-Y. I always have to spell things out because, especially in English, because it's, you know, not phonetical. Um, but I would look at his work. He's an expert on African-inspired religion in Brazil. And yes, there is a relationship between what, what, what takes place in Brazil and what takes place in Cuba uh, in terms of African-inspired religion. And then finally, I would say, Palo Mayombe, sin duda alguna. Palo Mayombe is the uh, West Central African or Bakongo inspired religious traditions in Cuba uh, that have roots in Cuba going back to the 1500s or the 16th century. Before we have a permanent English settlement in Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, we have Africans in contact with Arawak and Taino natives in what is now Cuba. Uh, coming into contact and developing that 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 tradition, that tradition which has a, uh, a West Central African uh, axis or a core. My book also explores Palo Mayombe, so I argue that Manzano and Plaza are engaging both of ideas from both of those traditions. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our next question um, is it posted in the chat by Michelle um, Sabasco saying. Uh, was Manzano considered a Babalao or a Santaria founder? Oh, wow. I've never had that question. Is Michelle physically, uh, is she here? She's here. Okay. She's just... I don't know if I can see Michelle. Here, I'm just shy. <laughs> okay. I'm never shy, but I'm shy about this. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't see her, but I can hear. Okay. Um, uh, I want to say, para decirte la verdad que yo no sé. Uh, I, Manzano has typically been regarded as someone who was uh, an assimilationist, who had assimilated completely to Spanish Catholic culture, 
as a way of um, publishing his slave narrative and publishing uh, his, um, his poetry. With regard to his slave narrative, uh, so to answer your question, not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge. Uh, my book is the first to argue in English or Spanish that either Manzana or Plaza were engaging African inspired ideas of spirit and cosmos. Um, there is a Cuban a scholar who now passed away, who was a palero, a practitioner of Palo Mayombe, the West Central African inspired tradition, who wrote uh, a manuscript. He never got it published. He started working on a manuscript. He was thinking about Placido as someone who would have had contact with the African inspired traditions. Placido is typically thought of being more radical than Manzano uh, because he was one of the leaders of that 1844 anti slavery movement. But uh, no, Monsanto has not been regarded in that way, um, though this, his relationship to the saints, which I argue should be understood as the Orishas, right? Uh, it's only part of his engagement with an African spiritual uh, um, tradition. So the answer would be no, but I would love to see more work done on it. You know? I'm hoping there's some graduate students out there who are like, ay, que lindo, que es esto? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is great. Okay. I want to ask more questions. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, a whole lineup of people here. So I know Ray is next. So go ahead, Ray. Hi. Uh, thank you so, so much for uh, por esa por esa conferencia tan tan interesante. Muchas gracias. So I have a couple of students here that uh, there's a lot of interest that we have. We have a class that is called Hispanic Experience in the U.S. Mm. There's a growing uh, interest on, on Cuba and the traveling to the island and doing research in the island, too. So uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about, you know, the practical side of your of your conference today, which is uh, to see because I know that that you have a record of traveling to the island and doing research there. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, the United States have changed governments during that time. And then the approach for the U.S. citizens to visit and work on the island. So I wanted to to see, you know, first share, share your experience in that sense, and also mm -hmm. uh, how is it to work with your colleagues here in Cuba, considering that you are a touchy subject that is, hmm, you know, it's a study, but it's not necessarily popular because we on the Caribbean don't see ourselves as black people. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's really hard for us to study and consider ourselves as mm -hmm. blacks. And then you go down there and you touch a very, a touchy subject. So I, I want to hear a little bit uh, about your experience down there. Okay. Um, thank you for that uh, question, uh, Ray. Well, I, I, the first thing I would say that I started traveling to Cuba in 2004. Um, and uh, I know that you're referring, Ray, to the fact that uh, that it is not common in the Hispanophone Caribbean for people to identify as Black, uh, perhaps unless they can't escape it phenotypically, perhaps unless someone's of a mahogany hue, of an ebony complexion, uh, then maybe they are considered black by themselves and by, by, by everyone else. Uh, and that is different. So there's a way of thinking about race in the United States that's dichotomous. Anyone who has an African ancestor that can be identified uh, is considered black traditionally in the United States, though some of that appeared to be changing with the advent of a mixed race identity in the United States or the celebration of a mixed race identity in the United States. Whereas in the Caribbean, uh, things should be thought of in terms of gradation. So skin color plays a major role and someone might identify themselves as a mulatto and they would talk about the different shades of mulatto. So if they're lighter, light brown skin, but they have woolly hair like myself, they can't escape blackness, uh, you know. Uh, but that's all very complicated. My experience, was that initially, uh, I traveled in 2004, George W. Bush was president. I was a student at Michigan State University. Um, I was uh, able to travel there. George W. Bush had made it nearly impossible for Cubans to travel. So I ended up, so all the Cubans that were on the flight, almost all of them had to cancel, all the Cuban Americans had to cancel their flights. And I ended up in first class with the Nigerian ambassador to Cuba. So that was fun. Uh, who I got a chance to hang out with later at the embassy. That's an atypical experience. And he was not a practitioner of Yoruba inspired traditions, though he was Yoruba. <laughs> he, he was very much Christian <laughs> and didn't want anything to do with it. But I did talk to him about it. Um, my early experience that I was interested in race, I wanted to do an anti-racist critique and find some sort of anti-racist resistance in Manzano and Plaza's work. Uh, 
and I was working with a scholar uh, named Jose Millet, and Millet is now in Venezuela. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Millet. I cite his work, uh, but he initially discouraged me from talking about race. He said, you know, bueno, por aquí la verdad que no hablan esas cosas tanto. So it was a situation where he, he, I think, you know, I was green, you know, in the US sense of that word. I didn't know a whole lot about Cuba. Uh, I was coming as an African American, you know, where you have the black power tradition, you have a civil rights tradition, et cetera. Um, what I found is that over the years, Cubans became more and more, including intellectuals, became more and more, and more willing to discuss race. Race became uh, a more popular topic, but the topic was brought to the fore, not by intellectuals, but by rappers. Roberto uh, Surbano does a really good job of demonstrating that in some of his writings. It was the, it was the rappers who were living in the marginalized neighborhoods in spite of the advance of the revolution, who were still dealing with a considerable lack of resources uh, that were saying, you know, hey, we need to bring this question of race to the fore. Um, when I traveled, uh, every time I traveled, you know, I traveled under the license of a, of a, it's a student slash academic uh, license. Uh, I haven't traveled, no, I traveled once after uh, President Trump, I was gonna say 45, but President Trump came to, uh, to office. I traveled in 2019 and he was in office. And I, so I've been there five times. Um, I guess uh, that's all I can say with regard to travel. There's a greater openness now. There's a greater conversation about race, but I find that Cuban scholars are constantly trying to balance what they do. So they're in a position where they discourage US scholars from making bombastic statements about racism on the island. They typically like to deal with that in their own way. Uh, so I typically don't do a lot of critique, uh, especially when I'm down there. I just try to listen and I encourage students uh, listen and try to understand the categories that people are using and why they're using them. For example, when my hair is really short, I've had, had a guy come to me and tell me, uh, he was, uh, he said, tu eres mulato, yo soy mulato, mira, te voy, a, te voy a vender un producto. He had like a CD he wanted to sell me. So I became a mulato in that moment because he wanted to sell me that CD and he figured that was a compliment, but it was not a compliment to me. It was not a compliment to me, but you know, he thought that it was. He was, he was upgrading you in his yeah, mind. Yeah, he was upgrading me in his mind. And in my mind, it was downgrading because, you know, I'm from Detroit and I'm black. So, um, you know, that was that. But um, I hopefully they will see the, what President Trump did was uh, he withdrew uh, US, US scholars, not scholars, excuse me, US diplomats from the embassy. Uh, he put Cuba on a list saying that Cuba was responsible for terrorism, a sponsor of terrorism, uh, back on the list, he had been on the list previously. So he ended the rapprochement that President Obama had started um, and uh, also withdrew some of the tourist, the, some of the tourism uh, avenues that had opened up, cruises in particular. So when I was there in 2019, Havana was pretty empty from a tourist standpoint, which is cool for me, but uh, not for the Cubans. They were complaining bitterly about that. Um, uh, President Obama had opened up a person to person thing. So we have to look and see what President Biden does, trying to get these names right, and Vice President Harris do uh, with regard to this. Hopefully, there'll, uh, there'll be a, another opening. Is that helpful? I hope, so. I hope I'm not that's, rambling. No, that's, no it's, it's very interesting uh, to hear about your experience and to think about um, how race is configured and constructed in different places, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, you have a you have a shout out from a, a fellow Detroit person, <laughs> Rashida Muhammad. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So I, I know. Um, I know. John. John was up next with a question. Um, you still have a question there, John? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. Padaway, for a, a great uh, lecture. Um, <clears throat> mine actually just from listening to your last answer sort of evolved a little bit with, with the question of identity. Um, you said you sat beside the Nigerian diplomat uh -huh. and he really didn't want to talk about this old or their history, but you researched on the history that was there back then and is probably still prevalent now. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you see, or do you see um, there being a topic where uh, the, the history of the Orishas and the concealment within the Catholic saints and able, able to hold on to that identity 
from when they were taken versus uh, people that are already in West Africa right now? Do they still see that same identity or have they grown past that and feel like they're more Excuse intellectual? Um, so that question, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking if Nigerians uh, still adhere to traditional notions of spirit and cosmos, if they, if they still acknowledge uh, the Orishas, Olodumare, Olorunolofi. Um, I have not been to Nigeria, I've been to Ghana. So I don't have firsthand experience with that on the continent. Um, with regard to my conversations with Nigerians, it's very interesting. I had a conversation with a Nigerian minister who was uh, raised in the traditions and Benin, in Benin city, uh, the old Benin before Dahomey becomes Benin. Um, and he had an ambivalence about the traditions. He had a certain fear of the traditions um, and he just did, didn't like some of the practices. Um, and he was very much identified as a Christian. I, I figured he was a minister. Uh, I figured for political reasons in part, there's a certain power and identifying as Christians respectable uh, but at the same time, he very much believed in the power of the traditions. And we went from having a very, <clears throat> this was in Charleston. We went from having a very, you know, smiley, you know, uh, I'm a respectable African-American with a PhD. You're a respectable Nigerian with a PhD conversation too. But be careful about this. And then this over here, and this is true. And da, 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 da. And, uh, um, and so my, in my experience, on the surface, yes, Nigeria is Christian, uh, but that at the same time, and Andrew Apter writes somewhat about this in his work, the anthropologist Andrew Apter, uh, whose work I cite um, in the book, that, the, that Nigerian Christianity still displays some elements of uh, traditional spirituality. Uh, but what you find in Nigerian You'd have to look at his work to get more detail about that. But what you find in terms of um, uh, Nigerian culture is that Nollywood or the Nigerian cinema demonizes and vilifies the traditions. Yeah, I mean, across the board, uh, without a doubt. Uh, they, don't, they, don't talk about, they don't talk in terms of balance um, or what should, what should be kept and what should be changed. They just, they just vilify it. It's like a it's like similar to the voodoo movies instead of voodoo, but voodoo movies in the U.S. So, move in. Wonderful. So I think we had we had planned to go until about seven fifteen. So we have a few more minutes left, and I know Andre had a question. Um, and then there's a couple more questions in the chat. So Andre, do you have? Are you there? Sure. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome to GSU. Oh, how are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. How are you guys so, doing? <laughs> we're doing great. Hey, so I haven't been able to read your book yet, but I promise I'll, I'll get there. Um, uh, so I think one thing I want to thank you, right? So I, I'm, I'm super glad you used that picture that had the, um, what was likely a, a Muslim guy right in the background. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I remember when I, when I was that few of our students understand that lots of uh, African slaves who came over already um, were Muslims. And many of them could write and wrote in Arabic and uh, spoke Arabic. And that's right. And that's a that's a good piece to kind of weave in because it's been erased from a lot of what we know, uh, or what we think we know in the U.S. So here's my question: We we just had our African American uh, read in two nights ago here, and I tried to kick off with comments, which I think you're you're working on here too. Is that uh, there's been a huge move from a focus on victimization and loss to an emphasis on adaptation, resilience, and survival mm -hmm. of these things. And, and I work on the Tonotum, and, uh, and I see similar things, right, where they weave their own cosmology into uh, Catholicism, mm -hmm. and a Catholicism that is really their own. For example, they're, they're followers of St. Francis of, of Assisi, but the actual statue they have is St. Francis Xavier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But they have renamed him uh, for mm -hmm. their own purposes and their own mm -hmm. belief systems. Uh, I, I'm interested to note is how how much was this an external attempt? Th these authors work to um, weave their own cultural understandings into into saints and daily practices, a means of purposely making political statements. And how mm -hmm. much of it was just simply um, advancing their own cultural knowledge? Mm 
which mm -hmm. I, I still view as being resistance, but it mm -hmm. may not like be like, I'm doing this to resist. It is simply this, our culture, this, how we understand it. Mm -hmm. and, and it moves forward. Well, thank you for your question, Andre. Um, I think there's a bit of both. I'll just, I'm going to stick, I'll talk about Manzano first and then briefly I'll talk about Placido. Placido in a lot of ways, who's somewhat like a Cuban Martin Delaney, though he lived and died before Martin Delaney, uh, or was born before Martin Delaney, died uh, before Martin Delaney as well. But he provides, because he was freeborn, he provides better examples of this, or clearer examples of this. So in terms of cultural knowledge, uh, to talk about Juan Francisco Manzano, since my talk dealt with Manzano, Manzano says from the very beginning uh, that he was baptized. And he says that his baptism was, celebra was a celebrated event within the big house in Matanzas on this uh, on the slave labor camp. And he talks essentially about the way in which the vestments uh, of his uh, of his Martianess, of, of the Martianess, or his, who he called Mamma Mia, or my mother, uh, were used in the process and how uh, his father, who was a harpist, played the harp to celebrate. Uh, this was really a big event. He really takes a lot of time up in the narrative. He really wants to establish the fact that he is a Catholic, uh, presumably for his white readership, those men uh, who are going to purchase his freedom for him. Um, and presumably, and he was married, uh, I believe twice. Uh, he was married, and so he was married, he would have been married in the church. Uh, but Masano does something else in the narrative. He talks about uh, moments of crisis where he's being beaten you know, beyond belief and his mistress is essentially trying to prevent him from becoming an African descended intellectual. She's particularly concerned about his uh, penchant for storytelling, uh, his, 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 the way in which he's improvising verse and some of the sorcery tales that he tells, <laughs> Cuentos de Encantamiento, some of the sorcery tales. And so she, uh, she does a number of things to prevent him from doing that. Uh, so how did Monsanto learn the sorcery tales? Well, when he, he would have learned those from his mother, perhaps from his father, but also from uh, the older, uh, elderly enslaved persons in Matanzas, at that, that particular slave labor camp. And we know that because he talks about Proverbs, two Proverbs that his mother taught him. Uh, and he talks also about something his mother said to him that he did not understand and that he ultimately went to the elders on the plantation, the women, in fact, uh, to clear it up for him. He said, I just couldn't understand what she meant. And so I went to them, but he doesn't tell us what she said or, or what they cleared up. One of the Proverbs that she put forth was, Dios puede más que el demonio, hijo. God can do more than the devil, is the way it would translate in, uh, in English. And it sounds like something I would have heard coming up. And I would think nothing of it. Like, oh yeah, of course, God can do more than the devil. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, once again, that distinction between good and evil would seem to be dichotomous in such a statement. But if you read on, you find out that he has this polydemonic notion of the spirit world when he talks about cosa mala. So I won't get into that. There was no room for that in this presentation, but that is an example of cultural knowledge, right? Of, a, of an African Caribbean epistemology that he's bringing to the fore that is definitely fused with some Spanish Catholic notions about the spirit world as well, what the, what the Catholics would have called demons, but Manzano called Cosa Mala. Uh, the political statement you can see, I think, in his work uh, when he's, uh, with a poem that he writes to his brother called A Dream for My Second Brother. And there he's actually working with the dead. That's an example where he's engaging Palo Monte, the West Central African inspired tradition. He talks about his parents, uh, remains. And uh, he talks about a ritual that he does in honor of his parents, uh, which we don't have time to discuss, but I deal with in chapter four. I, I see that more as a political statement as well as an example of cultural knowledge because he's trying to fulfill his mother's trust. This is a poem he's written in honor of his brother. It's the only poem he dedicated to an, uh, a Black person. And, uh, and he's doing all of this in order to rescue his brother. So Without, I won't give away what happens in the poem, but it's called Un Sueño a Mi Segundo Hermano, A Dream for My Second Brother. Awesome. Plas Plasto has several examples of the political statement. Um, you could look at his poem on the carnival uh, as one of such example, where he talks about um, the carnival masquerade uh, known in Yoruba as Egungu, uh, but in Cuba it's known as the little devil, right? Once again, because things, this transculturated colonial literature is written in a... Uh, 
uh, and, the, and the Spanish Catholic idiom so that it will be palatable to a metropolitan audience as I was saying previously. Uh, but then he says in the poem, but this masquerade, this diablito, ha venido a, a, a what does he say? A ponerles la ley. He has come to impose the law upon them. So they don't really know what he's doing. They're laughing at him because this is a moment that, you know, this is New Orleans or Mobile, this is carnival, but they don't really know why he has come. So there's a political statement in that text, uh, even as he expresses cultural knowledge. Awesome, thank you. That's awesome. Wonderful, I feel like our hour and 15 minutes is not doing this at all justice. There's so much <laughs> more to talk about. But if you, if you would mind, if you wouldn't mind one more question um, from one of our students here in the chat. Oh, you touched a little bit. Estudiante. Yeah, you touch a little bit on this, um, a couple of these differences um, throughout your talk, but um, she's asking, um, how did this, the experience of Manzano in Cuba differ from that of enslaved people in the US? And then you've mentioned a couple of little differences about owning property and things like that. Oh, okay, how is different, how they differ. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, uh, one of the differences uh, is that uh, enslaved people in uh, Spanish America were able to marry, legally able to marry, uh, because marriage is considered a sacrament in the Catholic Church. Um, and so those marriages were supposed to be honored. There were penalties if uh, an enslaver didn't honor those marriages or, or tried to, God forbid, prostitute uh, one of the enslaved people for his own benefit or her own benefit. Uh, there were, on paper, there were penalties. Uh, so if an enslaved person could get to the courts, they could push their case. Um, that's uh, one difference. Um, they were able to own property. That's uh, another difference. Um, so Manzano's family owned horses. And I found that very striking. I read and reread the narrative many times before I realized that he was literally saying that his grandfather had owned horses and that his grandfather had named the horses for his grandchildren. It's a really beautiful, tender moment in the text. I mean, it could also be read through the lens of uh, African uh, descended masculinity. So hopefully someone will do that. Um, and uh, that, so that's another difference there. And what he was fighting his mistress over, essentially once his mother passed, passed was the right to the, the debts that she owed him. He had, the, 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 the original horse had been a mare and so had given birth and there were other horses and they had lent the horses out to the enslaver's family. And so the enslaver uh, family owed Manzano uh, money once Manzano's mother passed, but of course he refused to pay it. And that's what precipitated his, uh, his escape. Those are two of the, the differences right there. Another difference is, is the role of the Catholic church. There, are no, there were no other churches sanctioned in Spanish America. Uh, doesn't mean there weren't, weren't any other religionists. I, I would imagine that there were. Um, in fact, one text I came upon about Eastern Cuba talked about a Methodist, someone being Methodist, but, this, but the Spanish had um, a position that Catholicism was the one true religion and that anything outside of Catholicism, officially speaking at least, uh, was not only sacrilege, but it represented someone setting themselves up, up as an oracle, as an authority, which was the problem that uh, with Monsanto and Plaza was that they were setting themselves up as authorities, uh, claiming sacred authority, as, uh, as Vincent uh, Brown at Harvard would say. So those are some of the differences right there. I hope that's helpful. And como se llama la estudiante? Fara, do you want to speak up? Sarah, yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this explanation. <laughs> oh, was it helpful? Yes, thank you. Are you studying Spanish? Yes. Pues sí. adelante, sigue estudiando. Yo estoy estudiando democracia y también uh, la experiencia de Hispanic American. De, Muy bien. De Hispanic, sí. Buena suerte. Bienvenido. <laughs> Gracias. De nada. Wonderful. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. I think we'll close with that. Um, Dr. Petway, we very much appreciate you coming. I, I want to thank Andre again for introducing us. Um, he's the one who made the connection and um, allowed us to, to, you know, have this, yes, have this talk. You. So um, I really appreciate it. Um, just looking here. Okay, just making sure there's no chat. Um, before we go, I just want to remind everyone, um, especially our students, 
if you're interested in learning more about this subject and, and other similar subjects, um, I know Dr. Walsh um, posted in the chat, um, you know, to consider taking uh, History 4460, Colonial Latin America, which is this coming fall. Um, we are every semester offering courses in Spanish. If you wanna read these poems and texts that Dr. Petway is talking about in their original language, they were written. Um, and then uh, next spring, we will actually have a course, uh, Dr. Radovich Fanta and I will be teaching a course about um, Afro-Latin America, sort of a survey course that will be uh, study abroad oh, yeah. going to the Dominican Republic. Oh, um, yeah. Hopefully, if we can return to doing study abroad, <laughs> we're really hoping that by next spring, we'll be able to do that. Um, so uh, please come and talk to us, uh, all the professors you see here, and we can uh, be glad to help you find courses that you're interested in. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. I uh, appreciate you spending this Wednesday evening with us and um, we will uh, see you soon. Take care everyone. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Bye, thanks.